Well, if you're anything like me, your Instagram is filled with all of these really cool teacher activities about orthographic mapping. And they have things like students pressing little poppets or using bingo dabbers and sounding of their words, putting the letters in 10 frames, all this cool stuff. But do we even know if any of this is sound? I've heard a lot about the science of reading. I've heard a lot about orthographic mapping and different ways to promote it in the classroom through these really fun activities on Instagram. But as a teacher and more importantly as a researcher, I need to know the why or even the if that is influencing all of these influencers on Instagram. All of these activities are inspired by orthographic mapping and it's all under the umbrella of the science of reading. So I found a research article all about orthographic mapping and we are going to see if some of these activities on Instagram check out or if they're just a bunch of hype because they look really cool in a video and they're easy to get people's attention. Well, hi, I'm Courtney. Welcome to my channel where we discuss educational research one study at a time so that you can incorporate it into your practice. All right, so the study that I have for you today is called Orthographic Mapping in the Acquisition of Sight Word Reading, Spelling, Memory, and Vocabulary Learning. It was published in a journal called Scientific Studies of Reading. So if you are interested in the science of reading or in following the research about literacy, this might be a good journal to subscribe to. I'm not sure what the fees are on it, but if your school is looking for some research-based resources, this sounds like it might be a journal that could be worth it for educators to keep up on. Now the study is from 2014 and it's based on a whole canon of work that this author has done in the past. So I don't want you to get caught up on the title that says sight word because I know right now there is a lot of controversy about sight words and whether or not they are real or not. And so I will go into why the author chose the term sight word and how the language that we use to talk about words and sight words has evolved over time. So don't let that scare you away. There's still a lot of valuable information in this article. So if you are wondering what all of this lingo is surrounding literacy instruction these days, go ahead and watch this video. I made it because I did not know the lingo that's going on right now. I'd heard of it. I kind of can put it together in a sentence, but I didn't actually know the ins and outs of each of the words. So if you want a quick vocabulary lesson before you start watching this video, then go ahead and check that one out and then come on back because there's some good stuff in here. All right, so let's start off with what is orthographic mapping? I'm going to use the definition that the author uses in this article. Orthographic mapping occurs when in the course of reading specific words, Readers form connections between written units, either single graphemes or larger spelling patterns, and spoken units, either phonemes, syllables, or morphemes. So it's that understanding of the written aspect of a word and the spoken aspect of a word. So the pronunciation, the definition, and putting it all together. So it's really important because it's essentially mapping out in your brain what our language system is built on. The reading, the writing, the speaking, the understanding. So it's your entire language program in one. The focus of this article is pretty deep and broad and that's because this author, like I said, is basing the focus of this article on, on decades of research that this author has completed and has also put into dialogue with other authors that may have agreed or disagreed over the last decades. The focus of this article is multifaceted it's looking to clarify the role of sight word retention as children are learning to read. Don't click away. We will talk about the definition of sight words being used in this article. So don't click away yet. It's also to focus on the letter sound connections that go into orthographic mapping as children are learning to read. And then to look at more recent research about orthographic mapping to build an even deeper understanding of how this works for students as they are learning to read. All right, so here's my disclaimer about sight words before we begin. Actually, it's not my disclaimer, it's the author's disclaimer and then my commentary. So basically, the author is talking about the ability to read a word instantaneously. The author says, at first, you have to go through the process of reading and orthographic mapping and sounding out the letters and building that in your memory. But as you become more fluent, it becomes a more instantaneous process. And so the author's talking about that instantaneous recall of words as a sight word. 
The author does clarify that a sight word used to be considered just high frequency words and everything was a sight word. Based on what I'm seeing now in classrooms, it seems like there's a bit of a war on sight words because a lot of things that used to be considered sight words can actually be decoded. You don't just have to memorize them. And the author doesn't refute that at all. What the author is saying is that in this context, a sight word is something that you have read a couple of times and it has ingrained in your brain. And so you don't need to spend working memory clarifying what the word is and sounding it out sound by sound, letter by letter. So we would probably now just say that it's a fluently read word. I know in another video I wrote, people commented that with sight words, you still do have to read, you know, left to right, letter by letter, and then your brain does it quickly. What the author is saying is that it's that lack of working memory that really goes into the reading. Whether or not you are sounding it out letter by letter and it's just a really instantaneous process for your brain or whether your brain is seeing the word as an image and can recall the pronunciation and the understanding of the word and how to say it. The point is in this case that you're not putting in a lot of effort to figuring out what a word is when you're reading it. The main point that the author is trying to make when they're talking about sight words in this article is that it's quick, it's, it's instantaneous. So we're going to set aside what your brain is actually doing to get to that instantaneous point because the result is the same. It's quick, you can read it, you understand the word, you know how to say the word. So that is our approach going forward for sight words in this article. Obviously, as I get more information, I will share it with you, but I can only read so much at a time. So we'll stick with this definition of sight words now. And if you have any peer reviewed journal articles that go into the nitty gritty about sight words because the research has been evolving astronomically in the last few years, uh, please do send it my way and I would be happy to look into it. The author goes into word reading strategies for students and reminds the readers that with orthographic mapping, it's the process of seeing a word written and hearing how it's pronounced so that those connections can sort of be glued into your brain. That when I see it, this word spelled this way, I remember that it sounds like this. And so there's a whole process that goes into that and we call that orthographic mapping. It's mapped into your brain. Now, one of the first things that needs to happen in order to promote orthographic mapping is students need phonemic awareness. And so they need to make the connection between the visual of a letter and the sound that the letter makes. So knowing that a W says w, as students build their phonemic awareness and they understand what each letter represents as a sound and what each sound represents as a letter, the next step is being able to put that into practice in decoding. So it's important for students to be able to use that knowledge to decode unfamiliar words. So not just their names that they see every day, but unfamiliar words that they haven't encountered in print yet. The process that the author outlines for children to develop their word reading abilities starts at pre-alphabetic, then moves to partial alphabetic, full alphabetic, and then consolidated alphabetic. The author turns to growing research that the use of physical gestures is really helpful for students to build their understanding of letters and sounds and how they go together rather than just listening to the sounds. And so if you've taught primary in the past and maybe even still now, the Jolly Phonics program was really big because it had actions with it like ah, 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 and t, 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 all of those things. And the whole point was to add in that gesture component. However, the author notes that the gestures that are actually the most important are ones that lead the child to saying the sound that they're supposed to say. So rather than using their hands and their body, using their mouth. And so this is where we see sound walls coming in. So a lot of people have ditched their word wall. Good job for you. If you still have a word wall, please feel free to throw it away and check out this video all about why we need to ditch word walls because they really are rooted in whole language rather than science of reading. The author is talking about how the gestures really should be at the mouth. And so a sound wall has pictures of kids' mouths saying the sound that a letter would make. So for ah, their mouth is open. For s, their mouth would be like um, and it just shows the mouth, not the eyes. So there's nothing to really get distracted on. So a student can try and make their mouth look like the mouth in the card, and then that can cue them to say the sound that they're supposed to be saying more appropriately. I'm just thinking back to teaching Jolly Phonics when I was a student teacher, and every 
student teacher that I know had the unfortunate experience of having to teach you, the short you in the Jolly Phonics program, I think it was. So I'm glad to see that go by the wayside because if you didn't do it in teacher's college, you probably did it when you were subbing because that's always one that we leave to other people to have to teach. Primary teachers, you know what I'm talking about, right? The author references an experiment that was done when they teamed up with another researcher a few years back in 2011 and they had three groups of students. One group they taught the letters and the sounds with the mouth actions. One they taught the letters and just sounds by listening and the other was the control group so they didn't teach them anything because we need to compare if we're just learning this incidentally or if there's instructional strategies that can actually be useful. And so the students that were taught the sounds and the gestures did way better than everybody else. The students who got just sounds only still did better than the people who got no instruction. Um, and the people with no instruction did the poorest out of everybody. So we can see that matching the sounds to a gesture, specifically the ones where you're showing students what your mouth looks like when you make a certain sound, had the best results for students who were learning their sounds and letters together. Obviously for those of us who are still completely masked in the classroom, this is a little bit tricky, but there are YouTube videos and Instagram videos and things like that that show what your mouth looks like when you make the sound and if you buy a sound wall um, or even take photos of your own mouth <laughs> making the different sounds, you can help cue students into what they should be doing with their mouth when they're making the sounds. So one point for the teachers of Instagram who talk about sound walls and have little videos about how they're using their sound wall in their classroom, you win, the research checks out, and you are using evidence-based practice in your classroom. So way to go. The author then talks about letter knowledge. I've seen this debate come up a lot of times. Do students need to know the names of letters or is just knowing the sounds good enough? And the author does make a case for knowing the names of letters. Certainly it's very helpful for teachers in older grades if the students know the names of letters because they can help them just by saying the letter names rather than just making sounds all the time. The author does point to previous research that shows that students who know their letter names tended to be able to read words that they had encountered before with better fluency. So it's not like they were encountering a word and it was brand new to them every time. They were really relying on their pre-knowledge of words and vocabulary in the group that knew their letter names as well. Now the author talks about a strategy that I actually have not seen on Instagram yet and it's using a mnemonic device to help students remember the names of their letters and it kind of goes by the sound first and then the letter. So you know how we post our alphabet cards up and there's an apple with the A and a bear with the B? This one has you turn the letter into a shape that makes the sound that the letter should say. So for example, the letter M you could turn into a picture of mountains. The S you could turn into a snake because snake S and it just builds that connection back and forth. The author didn't go into detail in this article so I would have to do more reading but I'm a little bit confused about would you then do different pictures for lowercase because how would they match up? So then are you learning 26 uppercase and 26 lowercase and can you buy this set or is it already made up because I feel like some letters would be very hard to turn into a picture. I'm not super artistic. If anybody has any information on this or has a link to something that you can purchase that has the mnemonic devices in it, that would be fantastic. So need a bit more information on this, but the author said that there is research that shows that using this strategy to build an understanding of letter names matched up with their sounds is very useful and requires less working memory than if you're doing Apple because Apple doesn't necessarily cue you to remember the sound. You have to think, okay, there's an apple. What is the sound of apple? Whereas if it's mountains and the M looks like a mountain, it's kind of all pushed together for you. Next, the author talks about orthographic mapping to facilitate vocabulary learning. So if we're comparing what is harder for students, learning how to pronounce a word or learning the meaning of a word, the author notes that learning to pronounce a word is actually harder. And when you're reading, you need that pronunciation skill. Unless you're just skipping over words and trying to use the meaning of the word rather than actually pronouncing the word properly, you need the pronunciation in order to understand the spelling. So there's a lot of connections there and a big case for 
learning how to pronounce words properly when you're doing silent reading so when it's just in your head and even out loud what the author talks about next i think is a huge selling feature for orthographic mapping so the author is referring to a study in the study there were higher readers and lower readers and students were given words to remember the pronunciations of just by hearing them so by hearing them over and over again would you remember that word and there wasn't much difference between great readers and poor readers but when the spellings were given during a lesson of vocabulary so students were hearing the word but also seeing the word written out higher readers performed far superior compared to poor readers and so a big difference is that connection between seeing the word and hearing the word this next study i think is really really cool and i think it's very useful for teachers who teach junior and up so teachers who would have a silent reading program in their class in the experiment students were given a passage to read and there were novel words so words that the students wouldn't have encountered yet and they were all underlined half the group was instructed to stop when they see an underlined word and take the time to pronounce it out loud. The other group was instructed that when you see the word, check off that you saw the word so that we know that you actually stopped and analyzed it. The students who had to read the words out loud learned the connection between the meaning and the pronunciation far better than the students who just checked off that they read the word. Because the students who were just checking off that they had to read the word were just skipping over it and trying to use context clues. So they weren't really committing that word to their memory and taking the time to study it. And this was especially true for poor readers. So this is something we can do in our classes very easily for those of us who have silent reading built into our programs. We have to tell our students, when you see a word you don't know, you must stop and say it out loud. You are allowed to break the silent reading code of silence in order to pronounce those words. Because or else we're just reinforcing that you can just use context cues and as we know from whole language failures, that doesn't work and that doesn't help students. And we can start to bridge some gaps for our poor readers. We can even give students the same passage so that we can have a bit more control over the vocabulary that we're building and we can instruct them to stop at key places that we want them to stop at. So actually a good silent reading program isn't completely silent. There should be breaks for students to be saying words out loud. I love this strategy no resources necessary, super easy to implement, and we're bridging gaps for students who need it the most. Now, I haven't seen this strategy on Instagram, so quick, one of you teachers of Instagram who are amazing at this stuff, go implement it in your class and make a quick video so that it can go viral and this strategy can take off. What all this research is showing us is that students need to be introduced to new vocabulary regularly, and they need to see the words written out when we're introducing new vocabulary so that they can start to build those spelling meaning, pronunciation, connections together. And so one thing that I'm going to start doing in my read alouds is instead of just stopping at words and saying, oh, did you know that this means la 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 la, I'm going to write down some of the words that we talk about so that students, even though most of my students are pre-alphabetic, they can still start to see what some of these words look like and build some connections as we go through. Graphophonemic mapping has shown to influence how people split words up especially when there's ambiguity in words. So for example, the word cash versus catch, where there's that T in there, people who have better graphophonemic mapping don't miss as many letters or miss as many syllables. Activities that build an understanding of really slowing down words to hear all of the sounds or breaking words up into their syllables are really important for students because a lot of students who are poor spellers and therefore poor readers as well, tend to miss syllables. So for example, if you think of the word evening, a good reader and a student who can spell well would know that that's three syllables, evening. But a student who struggles more would just say evening and not necessarily catch that there's an extra syllable that they need to add in there when they're spelling the word out. If they're not spelling it out properly, they're not as likely to be able to recognize that word as quickly when they're reading, and so it does all connect together. One of the strategies that the author talks about is one that I've seen many times before on Instagram. When you're mapping out a word, the author had students move tokens up, so just little like math counters, and move up the number of tokens as the number of sounds they hear, and then write out the sounds as they go. So for the word rush, r, 
uh, sh, and then they would write the R, the U, and then the SH is one sound made by two letters. Now this is an activity that I have seen all over Instagram using tokens, using bingo dabbers, using those poppets that are so popular right now. And so I thought, wow, this is great. I mean, this article is from 2014, so it's a little bit outdated. And here we are, we're picking up research from 2014. But when you read this article and you look at the citations to see where these types of activities actually came from and when they actually came, it's a little bit shocking because they came from the 80s. There's research studied from 1980, 1984, and 1987. My goodness, we are finally incorporating research that has been sound and around for decades. This is definitely not a teacher problem. Teachers work in a system where faculties of education, boards of education, ministries of education have not done their due diligence in making sure that this kind of stuff gets put into our repertoire of skills to teach students. And so I'm a little bit miffed that it's taken this long to get there, but I'm incredibly inspired that we have teachers on Instagram who are saying, you know what, you need to know about this information and putting some strategies out there for us to include in our practice. So thank you teachers of Instagram. Another point for you in our little, are you doing the right thing Instagram challenge. Finally, the author breaks up sort of what the two phases are that you need to teach orthographic mapping and building reading instruction and vocabulary understanding and pronunciation into your practice. The first phase is giving students the skills that they need to enable them to actually know what to do when they encounter letters and sounds and words as they're trying to read. So all of that early phonemic awareness and segmenting and learning the alphabet and putting all of that together is the first phase. Once students have all of those skills, you can focus on reading and spelling so that students build the connections between seeing words, understanding how they're pronounced, spelling them correctly, and building meaning that way. Because remember, we can build meaning based on what the words are rather than just looking at the pictures. Okay, well there you have it. The teachers of Instagram are checking out to be doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Their strategies are research informed, research based, and quite robust when you look at the literature that's backing it up. I've highlighted a few activities that are also research based that I haven't seen on Instagram, so I encourage you all to try them in your class, document it and spread the news so that we can all see what they look like in action. So those mnemonic alphabet picture things and also having students read words out loud when they're doing silent reading if it's a word that they have not seen before. In an age of disinformation and misinformation, we have all of these wonderful teachers coming together to bring evidence-based practice all for the sake of us to be better teachers. So this is really inspiring. I'm really excited. And thank you to all of you teachers who are giving us ideas and strategies to help build our own practice in our classroom. If you have any other strategies that you would like me to look into, please feel free to send them my way and I will see if I can find some research to back them up. Or if you have research and you're looking for strategies, send that my way too. I love a good journal article on a Saturday night. If you would like to follow me on Instagram, you can at Courtney Ann PhD. I will link it here and have it in the description box below. Like always, go ahead and share this video with another teacher friend of yours. It's always great to help build our community and it also lets YouTube know that this kind of information is important and we need more of it out there. The more you share, the more YouTube also shares with other people. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you have a great day. Bye.